welcome to our River of Life online Bible college. If you haven't already registered uh, for your diploma in biblical studies from a Hebraic perspective, then you can do so by going to our River of Life UK at hotmail.com account. That's River of Life UK at hotmail.com where you can start studying with us for as little as just £20 per module and every module has uh, 11 lessons and then you have the online assessment and there's 12 modules in total. So um, today we're going to be looking at God's economic laws. So laws of prosperity, economic laws of prosperity and this is lesson one in this particular module. And for our key scripture, we're going to go to John, um, th three John, third John. So that's one of the small Johns, three John, verses two to four. Is it God's will for you to prosper? Let's ask that question because there are so many people that think that um, no, God doesn't really want us to prosper because we need to be humble. Uh, we need to be kept uh, humble, kept poor and kept humble and more or less take a vow of poverty, etc. So is that right? Is that right? Well, in 3 John verses 2 to 4, we read, Beloved, I wish above all things, above all things, that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, John had walked with Jesus. He was the Apostle John who had walked with Jesus, called the beloved disciple. And as the writing of that particular letter, he was now advanced in years. So he should surely have known whether it's God's will for us to prosper. So if prosperity is evil, then why would John want us to prosper above all things? If prosperity is evil. Hmm. No, it's actually the love of money. If we take prosperity as meaning money, which a lot of people do in its limited sense, it's much more than that, but a lot of people take it in its limited sense. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Not money itself. That's 1 Timothy um, 6.10. There are actually people committing this sin, love of money, who don't have a shilling, who don't have two pennies to rub together. Unfortunately, at our office in the UK, we get people all the time asking us for money, but they don't want the teaching. They want to have the fish without being taught how to fish. Because if you give somebody a fish, the next day they're hungry again. Yes, but if you teach them how to fish, then they will never go hungry. But they want the fish instead of learning how to fish, how to prosper permanently because it is God's divine will for us to prosper so we can be a blessing to others. That's a qualification, so we can be a blessing to others. Because if you're not prospering, how can you bless others? Hmm. So that's why the Lord wants us to prosper. But unfortunately, a lot of people would prefer to be, be given a fish instead of learning how to fish. But in this particular model, we are going to teach you how to fish. In other words, how to prosper in every aspect of your life. Yes, how to prosper in every aspect of your life um, for, for the rest of your life until the rapture. OK, so let's have a look at the rich young ruler, because some of you might be already saying, yes, but what about the rich young ruler? You know, Jesus told him to sell everything and give to the poor. So, you know, if we want to truly follow Jesus, perhaps that means that we should sell everything, give to the poor and live like paupers. Mm. So let's have a look at Luke 18 uh, from verse 18. I'm going to read. OK, and a certain ruler asked him, saying, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There is no one good except God. Hmm. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother. And the rich young ruler said, all these have I kept from my youth. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, yet you lack one thing. Oh, what's that one thing? Sell all that you've got and distribute it to the poor and you shall have treasure 
in heaven, you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Well, that's an invitation to be a disciple. And when he heard this, he was a very sorrowful for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through an, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it then said, who can be saved? Who therefore can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Oh, gosh. So the rich young ruler, you see, the thing that he lacked, he said that he had, had obeyed all the commandments, but actually he had broken the very first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. He had put the God of mammon, money, above God. So he'd actually broken the very first commandment. And Jesus, seeing his heart, could say to him, right, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. You will have treasure in heaven. Oh, what does that mean? You will have treasure in heaven. Well, you see, he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and, Lord, and he will be repaid. It's written in Proverbs, that particular, particular verse. He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and he will be repaid. So he would have actually had a, a heavenly bank account. He would have actually stored up in his heavenly bank account treasure. Because that's how the kingdom of God, kingdom of God works. It's by sowing and reaping. Genesis 8:22. You know, as, as long as the earth remains, there will be sowing and reaping. Okay. So, what do we learn from the from the rich young ruler? I mean, Jesus went on to say, well, how hardly it is for a camel to enter eye, eye of an eagle than for a rich man. In other words, a rich man who's got who hasn't got his heart with the Lord. You know, he's put money. He's put the God of Mammon. You have to read the scriptures in context to truly understand them. You have to read them in context. And, you know, the context is that, yes, if you put your riches on a pedestal above the Lord, above God, then how are you going to enter the kingdom of heaven? Because you've broken the very first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Yes. Glory to God. And the disciples uh, comment was interesting. Well, who then can be saved? Um, because the Jews had had the opinion that if you were financially wealthy, if you were if you were financially wealthy, that meant that you were being blessed by God. Yeah. So so that, you know, wealth is not a taboo in Judaism. Wealth is a, is a sign that that, you know, you're truly obeying the commandments of God. But Jesus perceived this man's heart and he um, revealed that actually his heart was not right towards God. His heart was not right towards God because he had put money on a pedestal. Money was his God and, you know, he couldn't he couldn't relinquish it. I mean, just to give you a little testimony from myself, when I first went on the mission field, I gave up my home in the UK. I gave up all my possessions in the UK. I went out on the mission field for three years. When I came back to the UK, I had absolutely nothing but because I'd sown everything. I'd sown absolutely everything into the gospel. Amen. But I had stored up for myself treasures in heaven and the Lord has blessed me back abundantly. Amen. The word of God works. You know, the sowing and reaping is God's economic system, sowing and reaping, not the world system, which is the Babylonian system of selling and buy, buying and selling for profit. Yeah, buying and selling for profit. But God's system is as you sow, so you shall reap. It's a, it's a system of God's economic system is a system of sowing and reaping. So I had sowed all my possessions. I'd sowed my house. I'd sowed everything. And the Lord has blessed me back. Whoo, 30, 60, 100 fold. <laughs> you know, I now have a beautiful, big debt-free house and I have a debt-free car, etc. And the Lord just blesses me and blesses me and blesses me because my treasures are in heaven. And even if the Lord said to me, you know, right, okay, I want you to sell your house tomorrow and give to whatever ministry, I would be quick to do it because 
He is my Lord. He is my God. And I love the Lord my God above all money, above all, you know, if you want to see where somebody's heart is, look at their checkbook, look at their bank account and see whether they're truly sowing into, into God's kingdom or not. You know, there you will see somebody's heart because if they're giving to missions, if they're giving into ministries that are good ground ministries, that are producing a good harvest, yes, then they will be blessed back abundantly. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, flowing over. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So let us go back to um, a little bit more teaching here. And for our students, it might be an idea for you to actually write this down. God's economic laws, God's economic laws applied by faith. You know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's not going to work without faith. God's economic laws applied by faith will ensure that all of your needs, all of your needs are met according to his riches, his riches in glory, not ours, not our riches. Oh, thank the Lord for that. Not our riches, but according to his riches in, in glory in Christ Jesus, because everything, of course, is in Christ Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing in Christ Jesus. And you can read that in Philippians 4.19. But God's economic laws applied by faith will ensure that all your needs are met according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. But prosperity is not just money, is it? You can have all the money in the world, but if you're sick, if you've got a terminal disease and you're dying, what's it going to profit you? You know, absolutely nothing. So there's more to prosperity than just money. First and foremost, there's spiritual prosperity. Because we are tripartite beings. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a physical body. And first and foremost, for you to truly prosper, you need to be born again. You need to enter into spiritual prosperity, and that's in John 3.3. 3. As Jesus said, you, can't, uh, you, know, you won't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. What is the kingdom of God? God's way of doing things, as I said. You're sowing and reaping, Genesis 8, 22, not the world system of buying and selling for profit. Then there is soul prosperity. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You have a soul. John said you will only prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. So it's only as your soul prospers. So that's vital. It's vitally important. What is your soul? It's your mind your will and your emotions, your mind, will and emotions. That's your soul area. You must control your mind and this is very important. You must control your mind before you can truly prosper. You have the mind of Christ and you might think, oh, how do I have the mind of Christ? 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that you have the mind of Christ. How do I have the mind of Christ? When you control your thoughts. Woo. When you control your mind. You cannot control your mind without the word of God. And our students need to write this down. You cannot control your mind without the word of God being alive and operating, being alive and operating in and through you. I read that again. You cannot control your mind without the word of God without the word of God being alive and operating in and through you. And Jesus is the word. So when you have the mind of Christ, you will meditate on the word. You will think about or ponder the word. And that's in Joshua chapter one, verse, verse eight, where the Lord says, meditate on my word daily and you will have good success. Okay. You will speak the word, so you'll think about the word, you'll ponder the word, you'll meditate on the word, and then you will speak the word, and you will then act upon the word. Okay, so you think, you speak, and then you act. Glory to God. You will speak the word, and you will act upon the word, so that God's will, which is his word, God's will, which is his word, will manifest in your life. Jesus himself said... I can only do what I see the Father doing. And that's in John chapter 5, verse 19. John 5, 19. 
Your will and his will will then become one. Yes, as you ponder on God's word, which is his will, you will be become like Jesus and you will act upon the word. You'll think the word, speak the word and act upon the word. You will see what your heavenly father is doing and act on it. And your will and his will will become one. You will be perfect. Ooh, as your heavenly father is perfect. Hallelujah. With your thoughts, your mind, your will, what you do, yes, lining up with the word of God, your emotions and your physical body will follow. Yeah, your emotions and your physical body will follow. Glory to God. Then you will prosper and be in health, in good health, as your soul prospers. Your mind, your will and your emotions will be prospering and your physical body will follow suit. Okay, so your mind... And this is another very important point. Your mind is the battleground of Satan. Your mind is the battleground of Satan. He cannot touch your born again spirit. He cannot touch your born again spirit. He can only operate in the realm of the five senses. What are the five senses? Well, your sight, your hearing, your smell, your taste and your touch. Those are the five senses. Only in that realm can the devil work. OK, you cannot touch your born again spirit. You are 100 percent wall to wall Holy Ghost in your inner spirit man. Remember, you are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a physical body. OK, we have a sixth sense, though. Do you know what our sixth sense is? Do you know? Faith. Yes, faith is our sixth sense. Now, Satan can twist it and he can twist faith into fear twist faith into doubt and unbelief yeah that's what he will try to do he will try to put thoughts of fear and doubt and unbelief into your mind yes so that you act on that rather than on the word of god what the word of god says don't let him don't let him when those thoughts come and they will the devil will make sure of it. What do you do? What do you do? You cast them down. You cast them down. How? Speak the word. That's what you have to do. And you have to speak it. Don't, don't just think it. Speak it. Speak the word. This is your sword. The word of God is your sword. Your weapon against the evil one. That's in Ephesians 6, 17. You can read that. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you apply it by faith, not fear. Don't allow fear to come in because then the enemy's got you. Yes, because he operates in fear. You have to operate in faith if you're going to walk victorious in your Christian life. And use the sword of the spirit to cut out, to cut out. Yes, to cut out all fear, all doubt, all unbelief. Use your sword to cut it all out. The word of God. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's just quickly go there. Verses 4 and 5. And I'm going to read uh, from the King James. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down of strongholds. Woo, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, not fleshly. We can't wet war in the flesh. Yes, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are the strongholds that the Apostle Paul is referring to here? What are the strongholds? Well, you can have strongholds in healing. You can have strongholds in finances. And these strongholds are very often set up by erroneous teaching. So you need to erase any erroneous teaching. Yes, you need to pull, pull it down with the word of God, what the word of God truly says. Cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So whatever thoughts the enemy puts into your mind, fear, doubt, unbelief, uh, etc. You know, you've got to pull them down and you pull them down by using the word of God, the sword of the spirit. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, get rid of all those erroneous beliefs. Oh, poverty. Well, poverty is good because it keeps you humble. 
and you know it's good to take a vow of poverty and um, you know God doesn't want you to prosper uh, in the area of your your finances your wealth you know because he said you know you've got to sell everything no he tells you to sell everything if you've raised um, property or finances or whatever above him yes but if you've got God and he knows in your heart that if he asked you, like Jesus did to the rich young ruler, to give everything away, that you would do it. Yeah, so you can make a heart check right now, would you? Would you be prepared to do that if the Lord asked you? Okay? Because then you, you know, when he does ask you to do, to say, so really big seed, I get excited. Because I know my Heavenly Father's setting me up for an abundant harvest. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, any thoughts contrary to the word of God, you know, you need to tear it down. Use your sword of the spirit. Cut it out. Any thoughts that are contrary to the word of God, cut it out. Um, but obviously, you've got to have the word of God in your heart for it to work. You know, you need to meditate on the word of God, ponder on the word of God and speak it out. Glory to God. And you need to submit your will to God. As James says in chapter 4, verse 7, submit to the Lord your God, resist the devil and he will flee because this will not work if you're in disobedience. So your will must be the same as God's will. What's God's will? God's will is his word. Yes. Are you applying God's God's word to your to your daily walk with him? Are you being obedient to what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do? Yes. Or are you in disobedience? Because it won't work in disobedience. You have to be in obedience. And if you're in disobedience, then repent. Our Heavenly Father is, is merciful to forgive. So repent. So I just want to give you, end with uh, just a little bit of um, a testimony um, of a battle that recently the enemy um, gave me. And it's in, in the area of healing. Now I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's always God's will to heal okay and by the stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ I was healed 1 Peter 2 24 and um, I know it's not God's will for me to be ever be sick in my physical body but the other day you know two three days ago now the, the devil tried to put some lying symptoms on my physical body lying symptoms that could be terminal that could be fatal that could lead to death and immediately he was attacking me with all these thoughts in my mind oh you've got this you've got that you've got something else and you know you're gonna die it's it's terminal you know you're gonna die blah 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 and all the rest of the rubbish that he tried to put into my thoughts well I know the word of God I know beyond a shadow of doubt it's not God's will for me to be sick it's not God's will for me to go to be with him before my time. And in any case, when I do go to be with him, I'm not going sick. You know, you just leave your earth suit and go to be with him. That's what you do. You know, if you feel that, you know, if the Lord says, oh, well, I'm going to call you home because you've done what I wanted you to do in this world. And I'm going to call you home. Then you just leave. Leave healthy. Yes. It's not God's will for you to leave sick. Yes. You're not you're not called to, to get sick before you die. <laughs> no. Not if you're a born again child of the most high God. Uh, the Lord wants you well, because that is a great testimony to all the people around you that are watching you so that you're different from them. They go run to the doctor. They run to the hospitals, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, You know, they try to do all these different remedies, blah, blah, blah. But we have one re remedy. We have God's medicine and God's medicine is the word of God. This is God's medicine, the word of God. So immediately I used my sword of the spirit, the word of God. And I said, no, you don't devil. Lying symptoms, you get out in Jesus name. You get out in Jesus name. I'm not the sick. I am the healed. I am the healed. I am the healed. And I confess that many, many, many times, um, maybe a hundred or so times, perhaps more. Um, I got out some teachings on healing. Yes, uh, some um, Gloria Copeland has wonderful healing school, uh, two hours long they are. So you can go on YouTube and you can get Gloria Copeland's healing school and just play Gloria Copeland's healing school and again and again and again and keep confessing. Meditate on the word of God. By his stripes you were healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. 
you know, he bore our sicknesses. He bore our diseases. Amen. He bore them even before he went to the cross by his stripes, stripes on his back. We are the healed. Amen. And then just keep speaking it out. I am the healed. I am the healed. I am the healed. I am, am the healed. And just rebuke the devil. You know, tell him to get out. How dare he touch the anointed of God? How dare he touch this physical body? This physical body is the temple of your Holy Spirit. How dare he touch your physical body? It is the temple of God. And he has no right, he has no legal right to touch your physical body in any way, shape or form. So when those lying symptoms come of whatever it might be, you know, you just take hold of your sword of the spirit. You must do it and you must speak it out of your mouth. You must meditate on God's word and speak it out by faith in Jesus name. And he will flee. Make sure you're not in any disobedience, of course. You know, submit to God first and resist the devil. And he has to flee from you. Amen. And take his lying symptoms with him. Glory to God. And that's how you walk in victory. That's how you prosper. Spirit, soul and body. Well, in our next lesson, we will continue with our study of the word of God concerning God's economic laws of prosperity. We will get into more in-depth teaching. If you haven't already signed up for the River of Life Bible College course, I recommend that you do so because it is life changing. It will change your life. It's changed my life and it will change yours too. Glory to God as we get into greater, deeper uh, truths of from God's word. Amen. So you can do that by going to riveroflifeuk at hotmail.com and our office will send you details um, as to how you can join, how you can apply and uh, the costs and everything. But the costs are very, very minimal. I mean, you can start for as little as just 20 pounds, which I think is about $25, something like that. And you can get your first module. OK, because we, we don't just have the videos. We also have uh, handouts, transcripts and extra reading material for you to study as well, which only our students will be receiving. So take this life changing course. Yes, our diploma in biblical studies from a Hebraic perspective, because in many of our modules, we will be looking at the word in depth uh, from, a, from a Hebrew perspective, just to glean more meat from the word of God. And I know that it will be a blessing to you as it has been to me. Amen. Change my life forever. Glory to God. Well, that's all for now from me, Alison. And, uh, you know, have a great, great week. Bye bye. God bless.